In the game of basketball, the term purgatory is thrown around a lot, usually to discuss a team that's stuck in the middle. Not bad enough to get a good pick, but not good enough to actually make some noise in the playoffs. I don't think the term is used enough to describe players. Role players stuck on a trash can team that aren't young enough to be in the team's long-term plans, but aren't good enough to backpack the team themselves. Mr. Terry Rozier is a prime example of this. This man got traded to the Miami Heat, immediately went on a seven game losing streak, and still said that that was better than his entire time with the Charlotte Hornets. Oh my God. Pray for LaMelo. Terry Rozier isn't the only player that was stuck in purgatory though. There are a lot of players that need saving, so stay tuned to discover which NBA players need to be traded to a contender immediamente. Like, subscribe, and comment your favorite role player stuck on a trash franchise down below. Welcome to the sweatshop OT. You know, I'm going to follow it up by someone who I think is probably less impressive. I get Kelly Olenek. He moves the ball very well for a backup power forward. He's averaging four and a half assists, five rebounds, one steal per game, eight points per game. He's always been a great shooter where he's shooting 55% from the field and 42% from three. That's one of those players that I think Danny Ainge is looking at. That's, you know, not Laurie Markkinen that I foresee some team putting in a salary dump to get that kind of player because yeah. he's a good backup big. He's not going to, jump, like I said, jump out and average, you know, 15, 20 points a game. But he's someone, like if one of your bigs does go down, like he's someone that can play all right defense and he can score efficiently. He doesn't play outside of himself. And I think for a rotation player, you want that. And he is yeah. the quintessential, I know my role, I play within my role kind of guy. Exactly. He's a very solid backup big. He's a little bit on a lower tier than like the Goga Badatsis and right, uh, right. Oh yeah, he's not. Uh, he's oh not yeah, a Nas mother freaking Reed. Exactly, or or the Nas Reeds. Like if he was starting on my team and we had like playoff aspirations, I would look at that as a bit of a sore spot. But as a rotational center to get like twenty to twenty five minutes to a game in the playoffs, he is more than serviceable. He's a great shooter. That's been his calling card throughout his career. He's a decent enough defender. And then as as you mentioned it, something I never really appreciated about Kelly Olynyk. he's a really solid passer. Like, he's a very good passer, especially at the center position. And this power season, forward position. he's played almost like that, that secondary role, you know, yeah. kind of coming off the bench. You know, four and a half assists. I had to do a double take when I was looking through his stats, and then we're kind of going through some of those games, and he's just making the right passes at the right time. It's nothing yep. flashy or like, no, he just makes a good read and throws the ball down and bam, it's a bucket. Exactly. Okay. Tyus Jones. I was thinking about this earlier. The Washington Wizards starting backcourt may be the most bipolar backcourt in the history of the NBA. On one side, Jordan Poole, the actual definition of all flash, no substance, the offensive talent of a fringe all-star, the offensive flair of an all-time great, and then he has a basketball IQ so low that if it were the temperature, you need a light jacket. I'm and crazy. then on the other hand, you have Tyus Jones, the most vanilla point guard in the league, who is the definition of consistency and efficiency. Last year, every hardcore fan, which I feel like this happens every year, but still, last year especially, every hardcore basketball fan was just all on Tyus Jones Johnson. Just, oh, assist to turnover ratio this, efficiency that. Last year, he was averaging 10 points on 55% true shooting. Okay, mm -hmm. that's pretty solid. That's great. This year, you think his efficiency went down because he's getting starter minutes now. He's getting more focus from the opposing team's defense now, right? He upped his true shooting from 55 to 61.7. And his assist to turnover ratio is actually higher than it was last year. And higher than Tyrese Halliburton's. Now, obviously, it's on less usage, but still, he's still a great floor general. And then on top of that, he's still a decent defender. All of that is being wasted on one of the worst teams in the NBA. If the Pistons weren't in the NBA, the Washington Wizards would be getting lambasted every single day between Jordan Poole and Kyle Kuzma, and then Jordan Poole again because he's just playing that dumb. So just please, someone, Lakers, Heat, the Timberwolves, as you mentioned, someone, please, just get this dude on an actual playoff team so we can see his talents and he can be properly utilized in the role that he was destined to fill. Someone, 
anyone, please. You did hear what's happening with the Washington Wizards, right? What was happening? The Jordan Poole's play has been so bad, they have to leave D.C. and move to Virginia. It's not because of Jordan Poole. Oh, so I, I, I don't did know. See I did see a stat though. I did see a stat on Gills Arena, but out of 500 or something NBA players, Jordan Poole has the worst plus minus in the league. Out of 500 some NBA players, Jordan Poole has the worst. Everybody plus go minus vote for uh, Jordan Poole for the 2024 All Star Game to represent <laughs> your Eastern Conference. Go okay. ahead and uh, just go to NBA.com forward slash All Star Voting and. Put in your vote for Jordan Poole. Honestly, go do that just to support the Washington Wizards fans. They are in some scary hours. If, they are if it in isn't, NBA hell. They're not even in purgatory. <laughs> They're in if hell. If it isn't, they have two bright spots. I was about to talk about one of them for the video, Denny Avdia, but okay. I wanted to give him a bit more time. I feel like he may grow to be a little bit more than a role player. And then Bilal Koulibaly, those are their two bright spots. Other than that, it is scary. Scary hours for the Washington Wizards. So honestly, he was joking, but go go <laughs> vote for Jordan Poole for your 2024 All-Star game just to give the Wizards fans a bit more love because I am sorry, y'all. I this should be illegal. <laughs> Matisse Thibel on the Trailblazers. Matisse Thibel, the reason he's in the NBA still at this point is his defense. He's one of the best defenders in the league, good at keeping a player in front of him, but he has some of the best hands as far as making steals and blocks in the NBA. He's probably the best guard shot blocker since Dwayne Wade. The reason people don't like him, the reason the Sixers traded him away is because offensively, he's very suspect. He's, he's very suspect, he's very one dimensional. He was sitting at the dunker spot a lot of the time in Philadelphia. The reason I added him to this list is because in Portland, where the lights are a little dimmer, where he's on a rebuilding team, where he doesn't have as much pressure on him, Matisse Thibault has looked a lot better offensively. He's not doing anything crazy, obviously. Six points per game on 38% shooting from three and 3.8 three-pointers attempted. Watching him play, he does appear to be less of a liability on offense to the point where overall, I feel like he'd be a plus on a playoff team. He plays offense with a bit more confidence, the way he cuts, the way he drives, the way he pump fakes, and the way he shoots. He shoots with a little bit more confidence. When you include his defense, overall, he's a plus player. And I feel like on a championship team, as a wing that comes off the bench, or maybe a wing that's a starter but gets like 20 to 25 minutes a game, I feel like in that role, Matisse Thibel would be a very solid player. I think I just I think Portland is kind of overloaded with assets, and they're going to be one of those people that's probably going to sell at the trade deadline, and they're going to be looking to get as much value as possible. And the Bucks are one of those teams that have literally no defense outside of their star player and Giannis Antetokounmpo and a serviceable rim protector and Brook Lopez. They have almost no one that can go out and just lock a dude down that is comfortable with just playing, like you said, 20 to 25 minutes a game and just shutting the best player on an opposing team down. I didn't realize T. Steibel has a 6'11 wingspan at 6'5". That's yeah. crazy link. And pause, pause, pause. No, but... I think he's like a B-plus Tony Al. About the same height, bring a lot of energy to the defensive side of the ball. Neither of them are particularly great shooters. Matisse has grown up in an era where, you know, shooting is more valuable and, you know, has worked on that. But for a team like the Bucks, that could be something that is pretty interesting around that time. Because they don't have the, the, the means to really go out and get anybody, you know, a high-level role player. So why not get, like, a, just a good role player and someone that plays a lot of defense?